Welcome to On The Move. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. Appreciate you guys being here. Uh, Mac Worley here has organized this, so Good. thank you, for, Mac, for getting this thing going. This is really important stuff. Um, and I really like the fact that this is a study group because I prefer this to not be a monologue. I would like this to be people asking me questions, me asking them questions, getting a sense of what sort of things we want to focus on studying. Because at the end of the day, if the economy were to collapse, something happened to our society where uh, things get out of hand after a while. When they get back on track, somebody's got to be able to rebuild this thing and reestablish a constitutional government the way it was intended. And the only way we can do that is if we have lots of people who are up to speed on the Constitution. So a group like this should think of itself, in my opinion, as a, um, an army of constitutional scholars in the making. This is really important stuff. Everybody needs to be really versed on this thing. Without people who are informed about the Constitution, they can't make informed decisions about their citizenship, about what they do with their citizenship. Politics, economics, law, on down the line. So uh, I appreciate that this is a study for that reason. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Ben Philo. Um, I went to school in Oregon and uh, went in the Army after high school. And it was after I got out of the Army, went through a couple years of school that I just started looking around me and seeing how there's lots of stuff going on that doesn't make sense, that just right here in the gut tells me that's not right, that can't be the case in a country that's based on a constitution. And so I started just kind of asking questions. And I finally just, out of dumb luck, I was in a library and I stumbled into a book about the Federal Reserve. And I started reading this book about the Federal Reserve and all of a sudden, the world around me started making more sense. And of course, the questions that I had as a result of reading that book, I started asking them to other people who were kind of in that circle of knowledge. I started seeking people who were in that circle of knowledge, and the ball just kept rolling, and so here I am now. <clears throat> There's a lot more to know about the Constitution, I've discovered, than what we're led to believe there is. There's a lot more dimensions to the Constitution than what we're led to believe there is. And because of that, uh, in my opinion, again, that's why we have the rules we have right now in this country is we just don't know how to manage our own affairs under the Constitution. We are unaware of it. Um, as an example, yes? Uh, if, uh, if you could talk about the, uh, the Black's Law Dictionary and how uh, <clears throat> the amendments aren't necessarily how they, they may read. Okay. Uh, the, the question is, uh, a couple of questions. See, um, the Black's Law Dictionary is a, a dictionary that the legal profession world uses as their standard dictionary for legal terms. That's, it's actually one of them. There's another one that um, the Oregon courts all use, and that's uh, Webster's Third New International Dictionary. So whenever I make references to things like this, it might be worthwhile to just write them down so you, if you want to pick up a copy of your own, you've got the title and all that. So these are some of the books that I kind of wanted to bring attention to. And um, the edition of Black's Law Dictionary, if you're interested, is the, the fourth is the one that's most uh, used. Fourth edition? <clears throat> fourth edition. Do you know what year that is? No. Because so af after the fourth, they started, some people say, corrupting it. Okay. So there is one particular, this is Black's Law Dictionary right here, the fourth edition. Uh, it is from 19, So um, there is one particular term in here that causes me to use this book rather than the most recent edition of this book. Um, it's a term called levying a war. And it's found, that term is found under the treason uh, <laughs> article in the Constitution, which is Article 3, Section 3. So 
levying war is one of two offenses that constitutes treason. The other one is helping and aiding the enemy. So I wanted to know what levying war was, and I went to look for it in here. And it was in there. It is in here. And this is the fourth edition. Levying war is in the fifth edition. Levying war is in the sixth edition. It stops being in this dictionary starting in the seventh edition. They took it out starting in the seventh edition. So, just as an FYI, if you read it for yourself here, but for the bottom of the definition of this word, this term, uh, I'll just paraphrase it. Levying war means when a group of people come together for the purpose of forcibly opposing the execution of public law. Forcibly opposing the execution of public law. So, ask yourself, how much do you see that going on right now? <laughs> okay. So, the government is creating war against the people, right? Well, you can make a strong case for it, yeah. The levying war thing is something that is, I don't think it's specific to citizens, it's an act. And if somebody is performing it, then the act applies to them too. So nobody's immune from being described as doing what that says. And these aren't my words. I'm just repeating them from the book. So please look them up yourself. See for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Um, this is a really handy resource to have. It has a lot of Latin in it. The courts use a lot of Latin to describe what they're doing. So those words are in here as well. So it's a handy resource as far as a guide on how to understand the words used in the law. Just so you know what you're looking at. Um, and this is, I want to talk about a few other books here, just so you know they exist as study guides. What was the reason for removing that study or... I don't know, I haven't done that research. And I'll put it out there that it's worthwhile uh, picking our battles about what things we want to do research on, because we've only got so much time and energy. And there's lots of stuff to research. There's lots of stuff that I've done reading on and said, man, I could spend all week, all month, the law library studying that to find out what's at the bottom of that. There's a lot of that that we just don't know anything about, but it's, they're looking at us all the same and basically impinging on our lives because we don't know it. We don't know how to act because we don't know it. This book right here is really cool. This should be in all public schools, in my opinion. This book is an assembly of all of the original documents, Federalist Papers, Anti-Federalist Papers, all of that stuff is in this one book. Uh, letters, you know, from back and forth to the different uh, founding fathers. It's called The American Republic, Primary Sources. So these are all founding father documents in one book. And, It's from 2002. So I have seen this book on uh, Amazon and different uh, online sources. So uh, check it out there if you want to pick one up. But this is kind of a one-stop shopping for studying about original intent. It's kind of cool. What kind of documents is in that? Oh, well, let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> Colonial Settlements and Societies, Religious Society and Religious Liberty in America. These are the categories of things that are discussed, and they put the documents under the categories. Defending the Charters, Magna Carta, Petition of Right, an account of the late revolution in New England, English Bill of Rights, the Stamp Act, the War of Independence, the Bill of Rights, a new constitution, state versus federal authority, forging a nation, prelude to war. Uh, so these are the different subject areas that they have original documents uh, underneath those headings to speak to. So it's kind of cool. Cool. And this book here, or one like it, John Marshall is the first Supreme Court Justice. If you want to know what provisions of the Constitution mean that are closest to the generation of the Founding Fathers, this guy's words are still used today in the courts. 
his case law is still commanding our courts today. So on the different cases that he he's basically kind of God as case law precedence goes. Really important guy to read about. John Marshall. John Marshall. Okay. And the little subtitle here is Definer of a Nation. You can look more, you can write things down, come up and take a look at it and write the specifics down if you want to check it out. This book right here, <clears throat> I was pretty excited about it. Uh, I picked it up at the uh, Powell's Bookstore for six bucks. And the title is The Constitution of the United States, Its Sources and Its Applications. The thing that's kind of cool about this is it's great for a textbook because it literally <clears throat> puts down every article of the Constitution, every clause of the Constitution individually. And then below that article, that clause, it gives the history of it. So point by point of the Constitution gives you a little mini history of that particular provision in the Constitution. Really kind of cool. Now, I didn't start reading this until a couple nights ago. And I have to say that I have to step back on how excited I am about it. There's one thing in here where uh, under Article 1, Section 10 uh, of the Constitution, it says, no state shall make anything but silver and gold coinage a tender in payment of debts. Under the Constitution, the states are not allowed to pay for their debts with anything other than silver and gold coinage. Supreme law of the land. When it gets to that point in this book, they don't talk about that. They go right on to the next line after that. They start their conversation in that portion of the Constitution after that part of the Constitution. So it hmm. gives me cause to think, huh, well, maybe this thing isn't as straight straight up as I'm, I was hoping it would be. But I see other stuff in here that's like, wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. So it's helpful, but, you know, who, who are the keep authors? it open What's that? Who are the authors? The author is Thomas James Norton. This particular one was 1969. Title the Constitution of the United States. Subtitle is Its Sources and Its Application. But I really like the idea behind it as far as no permit shall be given by any regulation of commerce. I just totally open the book randomly. Commerce or revenue to the portions of one, to the ports of one state over those of another. Nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties on another. So here's a little snippet about what's behind that. One thing I'm noticing about here is they don't cite cases in them. That's one thing that's nice about Black's Law Dictionary is at the bottom of a lot of definitions there are actually cases that use that particular definition so you can go look it up yourself and watch it and read how the judges more clearly illustrate what it means and the dimensions of what it means for that book. They don't do that in the current ones. They don't put case law in. But this does have case law in the back. It's Appendix C. see here it says a list of the leading cases expounding the Constitution with notes indicating the tenor of each case. So it basically lists by, by alphabetically it says under the, uh, the heading of accused it says see criminal procedure. Under the word alien it gives a case for that. Under alien contract labor law cases for that. For amendments cases for that. Bank of the United States a case for that. Get the idea. So it's pretty, pretty helpful as far as getting you a, a place to start studying, looking up case law on what you want to study. And you can take those cases and begin a research project. It gives you some place to start, so that's kind of cool. Now, um, this is what I don't want this to be is a monologue. Please ask me questions. Feel free to make comments. What do you guys want to know? 
uh, is, there, is it a situation where you don't know where to start kind of a thing? I'm, I just want to make sure that I'm not presuming, oh. you know, presuming too much. The, the one thing I'd like to do, and if, if you guys would uh, be interested in this, is uh, to go around and just specifically say what you guys would like to get out of this. You know, uh, I'll, I'll start. Uh, first of all, my name is Mac Worley. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I started a, a YouTube channel to become an activist and, uh, and to actually inspire people to, uh, to stand up for their rights. One of the things that, uh, that's important to me is actually learning about the Constitution. I don't know everything there is to know about it, and, and you know, I, I'm, still, I'm still a student of it myself. So I just want to try to get more of a handle of it. And like Ben was saying, um, if, if it was up to me right now to, to reform the government, I wouldn't have enough basic knowledge to know even how to go about doing that myself. I mean, I, I know the fundamentals, but I don't even understand all of it. So I just want to get a better grasp of that myself. Uh, the, my focus on things that is tends to be more towards individual rights and freedom. Um, so that's what I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how that applies within a republic as opposed to like a direct democracy. Ben and I were having a conversation uh, the other day about how Washington state has the initiative ballots and that's actually goes directly against the, the republic. Uh, we, we are a republic, we're supposed to elect our officials to uh, to vote for us, and that's how republic works. When we use initiative ballot, that actually goes directly against uh, a republican form of government. That's actually a, demo a d direct democracy. So, uh, basically, that's that's what I'm here to do. Uh, does anybody have any anything any areas in the Constitution where you're specifically trying to learn more about it, or we could maybe just go around the horn and okay. just kind of everybody take their turn sharing why they why they came, what they want to know, kind of thing. You want to start? I went to independent study, so I never had a history class in school. And so as I'm older and I'm learning about it, I realize how much there is to know. And so just anything to get a I am Carrie. And um, I'm here, I think just to get, like Max said, better understanding of the Constitution because I often see folks in, uh, I don't know, white cops and lawyers and these people who think they're in a little different category trying to take these rights away from others. And it's, it's as if police officers don't even understand the Constitution. I'm, I'm beginning to believe that none of them have ever seen one or read one or been taught one. It does. Um, and private school is not much better, I have to say, because when the government got closed, shut down, they weren't allowed to talk about it. And I tried to bring it up, but this mm. Dr. B, his name was, said we're not going to talk about that. Now, what an opportunity to talk about history mm -hmm. in the making. I mean, and Obama, because we had a pro Obama at that school. Yeah. And she had written inside her folder. Obama is a terrorist. Inside it, not, you know, and somebody saw it. Somebody got banned. And so she had to take that out. Wow. But you can write, Obama is the king, and that's okay. Yeah. So I had to meet with the principal because Hannah said, my right to free speech is getting taken away every time I walk in that school. And I was very glad that she, she's 13. And she, so she, awesome. you know, I want to instill in her for sure. Yeah. The fact that she would have enough knowledge. I think she's got the backbone. She just needs the knowledge to stand up because this younger generation are clueless. I mean, it's, it's pretty scary what's coming up. And, uh, but yeah, she goes to a crappy private school. 
Uh, do private schools, are they uh, doing Common Core too, or is that just public school? This school is doing Common Core. Wow. So they're okay. grabbing now too? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. You can, you can pay $6,000 and get this to grab me up in education, educate for free. Wow. Yeah. And it's Catholic. No offense to anybody here, but we're not Catholic, so that didn't help either. And you'd be surprised if the liberal Catholics at the school with all the Obama stickers on their car. I was just I was just stupid enough to think that they wouldn't want abortion and wouldn't want the homosexual agenda because they're Catholic. Mm -hmm. But I was wrong. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church actually accepted a ginormous uh, money bomb from Bill Gates himself to implement that common court. Yeah, it did not come from the educators. No, the educators, I feel bad for them. I feel bad for the public <coughs> school teachers, even some of the private, but the public ones, because they can't teach. No, the thing is, is Bill Gates, it's in Bill Gates' best interest to do this because if he has, if they have a common education for everyone, then he can create education programs that are the same. <coughs> There's a it's, a, it's, a, it's a corporate interest. Yeah. There's a commercial on TV right now where a guy is standing there in front of little children and he's like, won't it be great when we have a computer in front of every little face? You know? I was, I was there you saying is worth enough to you that it causes you to actually look into it farther and study yourself. Because at the end of the day, you, you don't learn by osmosis. And so the words flying through the air out of my mouth to you aren't just going to penetrate and stick into your head necessarily. And the words that I'm speaking, I've got an hour and a half to talk. I don't. <laughs> Oregon law actually requires five years of a class, like math class and science class, on the Constitution. Eighth grade to the end of high school, you are required to have a constitution class, minimum. And then if you go to college, it continues. But the reality of the day, I went to school in Oregon, up to a bachelor's degree. I know I got nothing close to that. And so our reality is that the people who are in charge of carrying that law out are willfully suppressing it. And the effect of that is that we emerged from high school as graduates who are constitutionally illiterate. I am one of thousands of people who are dumped onto the streets out of those public schools over there, and we are incapable, intellectually incapable of defending ourselves. 
even though the law says we are supposed to be able to defend ourselves. And how else can the ignorance is no excuse make sense? We are presumed to know the law. And in that state, the law literally requires us to be taught the law. <laughs> so we can know the law. And ignorance won't be an excuse because we won't be ignorant. And they also, over there, I know for sure, in Oregon, ignorance is not an excuse for not knowing the law. So, you would think so. The thing is, the people who become police officers are the result of a public school system. They graduate from high school first. And so they come out of high school. There's no excuse. That doesn't matter. The thing is, is Oregon is a perfect example of the double standards that we are held to the the hard end of. The law requires them to teach us the law and the Constitution so we know what we're doing, but they don't. It is their duty, constitutionally required duty, to carry out this law because if they don't, they're basically saying, legislature, we don't care what you have to say. And the legislature is whose voice? People's Ours. voice. So our voice, yeah, our well, <laughs> not anymore. In theory, in yeah. theory, but it's not. in theory, I'm talking theory. Here. Yeah. I'm not talking about reality. Real, I'm talking about theory. In theory, our voice is supposed to be carried through their mouth onto the the legislature's floor to pass bills in for our purpose, for our benefit. That's the reason why they're there. And so when they do pass a law. A law, for example, the one that requires five years of Constitution education, how can it be argued that that's anything but great for us? But for the folks who are in the executive branch who are in charge of carrying out that legislature's work in that law, they aren't. And the result is, is that now we're so far gone as far as constitutional education goes that we don't know what ends up. We don't know who to vote for. We don't know who to believe, what to believe. We don't know what's true. They'll make assertions, official assertions, all day long, but we don't have the constitutional lenses to see through the fog. Well, I'm talking about just the basic carbon stone laws, such as like what Matt is doing with the weapons in public place. I have been pulled over because I was on a scooter and my shirt blew up and my gun was here. And a detective pulled me over, took it, and put it on his car like I was going to shoot him. I had to move my hand. I asked him what I had done, and I had done nothing. He just happened to see that I had a weapon, and he ran to see if it was legal. That kind of law is what I'm talking about. <clears throat> yeah, and the fact that he didn't know, he, exactly. acted, he acted without knowing, it shows how comfortable they are with just doing things willy-nilly. They don't care about repercussions because they have no sense of accountability because the system rewards them for their lack of accountability. They get defended all day long at the state's expense, your expense, our expense. So that's, we can go, we can really get down that track, there's lots of tracks to go down. Uh, but uh, I guess I want to continue on our uh, introduction. There was, there was something else that I was thinking about that it's, it's can't, must not have been that important, so. That, that bird has flown the coop. <laughs> yeah, the bird flew the coop. Yeah. He'll probably pop back up. Yeah. Probably. Somebody will say something. Oh, oh, oh. Raise your hand. <laughs> I'm Cindy and uh, Sydney. Cindy. Cindy. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, you know, in high school, I hated history. I hated all government classes, all that. I couldn't stand it. I didn't know what it involved me in 200, 300 years ago. I don't care. So now I find myself older, and I'm really interested, and in, <clears throat> especially interested in what the Patriot Act has done to the country and. You know, does that really follow the Constitution? And there's just a million, like you said, a million other questions and things. And so I figured, I might as well learn. Sure. That was the that was other point I was going to make is, is we have to develop and figure out why why we're doing what we're doing so that we develop an appetite for mm -hmm. digging through this information, for learning this information. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably most of us have that appetite. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you really want to spin your head, the Patriot Act is bad enough as it is, but the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, that doesn't get hardly as much attention as it should. Uh, that thing will make your head spin. They, they legally have the right to kill you now, according to that. It's just a dangerous thing. It takes away more rights. That's scary. Yeah, it's pretty nuts. 
Jamie Herrera Butler did vote yes on that. That's crazy. Yeah. Did that come after the Patriot Act? It did. Yes. Yeah. And so, is that Homeland Security that comes under that? Well, he, yes. Yeah, I, 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 the NDAA is basically an updated version of the Patriot Act. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's even more intense, but I, I, I personally, that's another thing I'm going to be studying myself is get, like delving way into that, find out who voted for it. Uh, that's actually going to be a series on my, uh, my YouTube channel as well, is trying to figure out and break it down, what it does. Because a lot of people, they don't even know, you know, what exactly it does or what it means, you know, so, and how unconstitutional it really is, or even why it's unconstitutional. You know, so. those, are, those are good, good things to study. For this, because we can look at the specific <clears throat> ways that they violate the Constitution, go to the Constitution to those, 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 are, those are excellent ways to learn because we're learning by example. Yeah. Okay. Recent data. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. That looks into, I think. One of the hazards of <clears throat> using case law, modern day case law, is there's there's been a lot of judicial activism where they basically uh, reconstrue the intent of the law or they don't disclose key things in the law that cause you to see it in a completely different way. One of the things that I've noticed about a lot of case law is they don't talk about really <coughs> fundamental elements of the law, i.e. definitions of the very words themselves that are used in the law. Most people think of themselves, uh huh. Most people think of themselves as a person. Anybody here not? Not. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, okay, so. I don't know why. All right. <laughs> just, just by the way I'm asking that question. It sounds like he knows what he's saying. Just by the way I'm asking that question, it sounds like a, a loaded question, so I'll just spill the beans. So the word person in the law, uh, the way it's used in the law, is an extension of the Greek or a. Uh, a modern version of the, of the Greek word persona. Persona is that mask that you put in front of your face in Greek theater to become different characters. So, you can be a person of many different stripes, all of a different legal capacity. Uh -huh. So, that, if, you are a, if you are a person, it doesn't mean that you're a citizen. It doesn't mean you're a, gen a member of the general public, but they use, you'll see that word person used in the law all the time. And, and then there's also citizen with a capital C and citizen with a small c. And mm -hmm. So, um, the reason why I have this thing up on the wall here is the Oregon Revised Statutes, and one of the things that's kind of nice about the Oregon laws is they're pretty in your face, pretty clear about the meaning of things. It's really exciting stuff. And there's a chapter in the Oregon Revised Statutes Chapter 174, and Chapter 174 deals with the construction of statutes. Now, when you see the word construction used by a judge in an opinion, uh, you'll hear uh, strict construction and loose construction and construction this, construction that. The word construction, when the judges use it, isn't the building of stuff. It is the word construe, mm. the act of construing, i.e. interpreting. And so this chapter, chapter 174, is there for the purpose of, it's, it's the legislature's guidebook on how to construe the laws that they write. It's like 101. Reading the law, 101, is what chapter 174 is. It's really cool. And they have a definitions section in chapter 174. And at the beginning of that definition section, it says, these are the definitions that apply to all the laws unless any particular law has a definition of its own that's different from this. If it does have its own definition, that's the definition that's being used. If it doesn't have its own definition, these are the definitions that we want you to go by. It's like the general application definitions for terms. Person is one of those terms. So that, that seems to be like a really big uh, issue when, when interpreting laws and the constitutional definitions actually of the amendments and, and what it means is you have to actually learn the, the actual definitions mm -hmm. and intent that they used when they wrote the, the words to begin with. So, I mean, you can see a word that's so simple like person and it actually means something totally different. And, uh, you know, they, they used 
a bunch of words like that that might mean something now to the normal person, uh, but back then it meant something different. And in the dictionary, it means something totally different entirely than even back then. Yeah. I mean, it, you can already see just how, like, if you're if you're looking at word by word, looking up the definition of each word in the Constitution, how long it could take to actually study and understand this document word for word. In Oregon, in Oregon they, do, they do the, uh, the laws a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. In Washington, the question about what a law means, then they sit down and, and it's impossible to actually do, mm -hmm. but they sit down and they go, well, what was it supposed to mean in the first place? Yeah. Well, this in Oregon, they don't do that. Mm -hmm. Which we and Ben talked about this before. Mm -hmm. uh, Oregon's set up a little bit differently, mm -hmm. but that's that's the way that they do it in Washington. Yeah. I, I have to concede I've, I've done a little reading of the law of the what's called the RCWs. Anybody not know what that means? <laughs> Revised Code of Washington. It's basically the same thing as the Oregon Revised Statutes. Same thing, they just call it a different name. So Revi Revised Code of Washington, RCW, is what the state laws of Washington are. ORS, Oregon Revised Statutes, is the Oregon version. So the RCWs, I've discovered by reading some of these basic construction laws and definitions, they leave a lot to the imagination. And that imagination is a dangerous thing. Because if you don't have things locked down as far as meanings of things, hey, you can just fiddle with it all day long and achieve the things that you want to achieve, even if they're unconstitutional. Because, hey, look, this law says we can. And people who don't have an education on the Constitution don't know any different, and they don't know how to counter it. And one thing also, uh, and I'm learning this uh, based on the court case I'm going through. If you guys don't know, I got uh, uh, unlawfully arrested for open carrying in Vancouver here. Um, and uh, the displaying a weapon law is what they, they picked me up on. It was, uh, it, it, they also got me for trespassing. Um, I was standing on a public sidewalk and I was picked up for trespassing. Uh, but the uh, displaying a weapon, I'm also charged with that. And uh, in the law, it's been really narrowed through the court system uh, to where it doesn't even meet the same, uh, same standard basically as what they can pick you up on out there. But uh, the way the law reads is if somebody basically feels threatened or their safety, uh, if they feel unsafe in any way uh, based on you carrying something capable of producing bodily harm or, or death, then you can be charged with displaying a weapon, which is basically the same thing as brandishing a weapon. Uh, so it's like, you know, open up your jacket and say, hey, don't mess with me, I got a gun. You know, so you'd be walking down the street with a baseball bat on your shoulder coming from the, the diamond or something, and somebody can feel threatened for that, and they can pick you up for displaying a weapon. So, uh, it, but the, the, court, uh, the courts have narrowed through uh, the Washington State Supreme Court. They've narrowed the, uh, the actual uh, uh, definition of that law on two different accounts. The first account, uh, I believe it was uh, that a reasonable person, what a reasonable person would feel is, uh, is constitutes a threat. And then the second one, uh, it, they define what a reasonable person is, and the, the reasonable person is somebody that would know what the law is. So they have to, that's what the, the law, the intention of the law is, but that doesn't stop them from arresting you and you having to spend thousands of dollars on a lawyer to, to fight this through the courts. Fortunately, yours is pretty well tested in case Mm -hmm. One of the things, though, that's a little bit different when you're talking about a criminal situation, mm -hmm. criminal law, whatever, um, criminal codes have their own definition of person, mm -hmm. and that does include everybody. Nobody is outside of the criminal law. Mm -hmm. So in the criminal code, the person is defined in such a way that it embraces everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there are, there are other markers to look for to find out whether what they're talking about is applied to you or not. Mm -hmm. So this is just 101 stuff yeah. that it's yeah. we've just been deprived of an opportunity to know more about. So this is kind of getting that ball rolling. Um, one thing I want to show you, just just if you want to use the Oregon Revised Statutes as a, 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 a clearer example of what laws my opinion should look like. I'm going to show you this, and all you do is you go to. Yes, 
search engine, I'm using Xquick, type in ORX, and imagine if you type in RCW, you can get a hit for the revised code of Washington also. Right? So the ORS is right here. Clicked on that, and that's why I have this page right here. This came up, this is that website. Now, this is a brand new design for the web page. It's kind of getting used to it myself, but you just go down the line here, and these are the different chapters. Each volume here covers a multiple of chapters. And the one I want to show you is right here, volume five, state government, government procedures, land use, that sort of thing. Does anybody need to get over here so they can see it better? Or Okay, so I'm going to click on it, and it just kind of extends down from here. And specifically, there's chapter 174 right here. Click. And at the top of here, this brown wall is not the most clear thing to see these things on, but at the top of here, the cursor, construction of statutes, general definitions. And we go down here. The stuff at the top is the contents, the contents page. You just keep going down, and then you start seeing the body of the laws themselves. So, uh, 174, 100 is where the definitions are. And that's these guys right here. I'm going to break this, expand this a little bit. So here is the definition of person. So, you read it. Person includes individuals, corporations, associations, herds, partnerships, limited liability companies, and joint stock companies. And that's because in the law, person is a mass. It can be multiple different things as a person. And, yes? Do they, because um, I haven't looked at that, Define the word individual in the URS. No, not for the not here, but this is where it starts getting into me getting farther into things. Uh, the Oregon Constitution. Uh, keep this definition in mind. You see the word person being individual. So that would be the only thing that might cause somebody to say, well, there you go, right there. That's the general public, right? But notice that how individuals is on the same list as all of these legal, these things are called legal fictions. All these corporations, associations, firms, they exist in, in the mind only. They are not physical things. They exist on paper and in the mind. The only thing that gives them life are people occupying their positions inside. And those are the individuals. And I'll show you why. Let's go to Oregon Constitution. And, and just so you know, as well, Going back here to the main page. This is kind of a one stop shopping uh, spot, the website, because it also has the Oregon Constitution, right here, the United States Constitution. And for any of these provisions in, these constitu in the Constitution, state or federal, or, or the laws themselves, right here, this word annotations, right here is a breakdown of the cases that have been decided for every one of the provisions in all of those bodies of law. So if you want to do some case law studies, this is kind of a, a quick snippet of, of what the cases have decided on, on any provisions in those bodies of law, FYI. But I'm going to go to the Oregon Constitution. Are most people here from Oregon? Well, I'm, the reason why I'm not using uh, the RCWs is because they're not as clear. They're just simply not as clear as the Oregon stuff, and I, I, I want to use the RCWs, but for purposes of showing you fundamentals, the clarity of what things are in the law in another state, it makes you ask yourself, well, why is it so fuzzy here? Why are they so ambivalent about what they're trying to say? Well, this transfer to Washington? I mean, do these apply? It would take... As far as my understanding, it would take testing it in the courts and using a court situation to apply the constitutional provision called the full faith and credit provision. All states are required to give what's called full faith and credit 
to the laws and the decisions, the case decisions from other states. And so if you wanted to argue, I really, really stepping close towards getting legal advice. Well, I know you're saying if I was in a court in Washington and I pulled up a board and, you know, this is how it is there, you got to honor that. Right. And so that, that's the reason why I'm using this. If you keep the full faith and credit in mind, think of it in terms, as far as a bridge between the two, think, use that as your bridge, just to use it as an example, using Oregon as an example of, of how much more clear it is over there in terms of seeing what you're reading in the, in the RCW version of it. Uh, just as an educational exercise, just to get a better understanding. Because without understanding, you're, you might as well just go home. <laughs> well, is this going to be about state constitution or federal constitution? All um, of it. It's, it's all related. Yeah. Uh, the, all, that's, that's a fine. Right, I know that it's yeah, an umbrella that, game. So, I can see that I could spend more time on this little exercise than probably we want to right now. And so, you've seen the definition of person yourself. I'll tell you that the Oregon Constitution says that um, all laws are, are required to pertain to one subject and matters that are properly connected to that one subject. So, in the definition of person, if somebody wants to make the argument that individuals means the public, is that interpretation consistent with the single subject requirement of the Oregon Constitution, which says that every law has to pertain to one thing and things that are related to that one thing. If you're going to say that the public belongs on the same list with a bunch of corporations, that doesn't fly. So that interpretation doesn't pass the single subject requirement test of the Oregon Constitution. Do you know if Washington has that same single subject interpretation? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. So this, I mean, this is another reason, uh, you know, we're, we're going to study uh, not just the federal constitution, but the state constitution, and obviously uh, Oregon is really a close neighbor, and you know, he, he's got a lot of knowledge on the Oregon constitution. We're all going to learn as we go. Uh, nobody is an expert here, so uh, a lot of this is going to be individual I'm, study. I'm guessing that most of us are probably going to want to study in Washington, yeah. even, if it, even if it means we don't understand it as well at first. Um, we want to understand. It. Mm -hmm. So that would just be my okay. Idea. So if I'm only using the Oregon stuff as a more helpful teaching tool, so you can understand the fundamentals better, that's what I'm trying to get across is the fundament, the concepts, and I want to use sources that more clearly explain those concepts. It's more difficult for me to show you what I'm talking about by using laws that are less clear. So I'm going to let you decide. Do you want me to use the RCWs or the ORSs? I'm still going to say that for most of us, we're going to be more interested in the Washington stuff, even though it's, yes, it's, yes, it's more difficult. Uh, but then that also that also brings up the subject that this is what we have to deal with. And we have to learn to deal with. It. Do you guys have any problem like comparing how Oregon is and compared to ours? And that's and that's not that's another, another deal. And that's a good thing as well because if you compare Oregon to Washington, then we can see where there are differences between the states. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as a compromise, then maybe what we ought to do is if I'm going to cite the Oregon stuff. I also need to dish up the, the, the analog in the RCWs, if it exists. For okay. example, the law in Oregon requires five years of constitutional education. It doesn't exist in Washington. I, I've traced it back to 1929, I think, in Washington here recently. And uh, at no point in time has the constitution class laws of Washington put any kind of a class time requirement. It just says these schools shall teach the Constitution as a requirement for graduation. Okay, now, do either, do either state constitutions have anything about education? 
I don't know. If I don't know something, I'll just tell you. Um, I can't speak to it because I, I don't know what the Oregon Constitution or the federal there's nothing federally in the United States Constitution that deals with education. But that's a state. That's a state sovereignty sort of thing. That's a state level thing. Therefore, and then it's then then becomes the question: When is the state stepping on the right to us to teach our children as we wish? Um, I almost forgot. This is a book. This is both the Washington State Constitution. Washington State Constitution and the Federal Constitution in one book. And uh, there's a group called the Freedom Foundation, and I believe they're up in Olympia. Somewhere up there. Olympia, uh, somewhere. And they're the ones that make this. Now, I went to their website, and I couldn't find any reference to how I could pick one of these things up from their website. But I found out about it from them. Is yes. that 1889? This is not the original Washington Constitution. This is, there's two Washington Constitutions, so you know. And the original Washington Constitution is the one that's on the books registered in D.C., uh, according to some folks who've been doing a lot of research here in this Clark County area. There's a group called the Sovereign Project, and they've done a lot of research on the Washington Constitution situation. They have both the original Constitution on their website as well as this Constitution, and you can see point by point point to point the differences between them. Kind of cool. So the background, the background behind that is our current constitution wasn't actually ratified correctly. You said it wasn't ratified correctly? Yes, it was not. It was the, the first one mysteriously burned up in several different places at once. Except for one copy in DC. So, this is the kind of path we're on, just so you know, this, this, this learning gonna, stuff that we're doing. I'm going to pass these around. Okay. We have a phone number for a free foundation on it. Oh, okay. Um, on, cool. While I'm on the, on the back of each one, if anyone wants to call them and see about getting copies of these. I, I think it's really important uh, to, to have, and I think it's also for due diligence purposes to I, I've actually read through a lot of the Washington Constitution, and i got to say, not excited. <laughs> There's a couple provisions in there that are pretty cool, like the, the, the gun rights provision is really nice. Two separate, one for militia, one for gun rights. Hmm. And there are two separate articles in the Washington Constitution. Nice. There's, there's no confusing them like they try to do with the United States Constitution. Speaking of which, I was recently reading a uh, uh, RCW and I got to look at more into this, but uh, I just want to bring this up. Uh, there's actually an RCW preventing uh, a militia, uh, like uh, citizens uh, getting together in a militia uh, for like getting organized, basically. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the, the case law on it, but I, I also and I also don't know what stipulates them, uh, you know, being a militia. Do you have to actually say that you're a militia or if you thank you, appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the militia has to come under, has to be a product of lawful authority. I mean, other, other, well, otherwise you've got gangs in the streets. Yeah. You know, that's basically what a, an unlawful collection of guys with guns going around brandishing their guns, shooting whoever they want to. That's called a gang. So, well, yeah, but yeah, law enforcement deals with it. So, you gotta be careful about your exercise of your rights. You gotta do it lawfully and with without abusing the right. So. But see, I think where some of us may be, I know I am, is I wake up every day wondering, is this the day they're gonna come to my house? Because they actually have come in my house when we were out in the country. They broke in, they left the subpoena, and they went for our house. 
totally illegal. Mm -hmm. um, and it just pisses me off. And, and every day I wonder, is this going to be the day they come to try to get the job? Is this the day going to come to try to tell me how to raise my kids? I mean, it's like that. And I think a lot of us are just to that point. So if you count on them, they are illegal people. They're the ones that I'm more concerned about. product of the public education right. system. I, I'm going to promote really strongly here that a big target of what we're doing here should be the public schools. Uh, they are the factories of the ignorance that cops are infected with. They are the ones who, who erected the ignorance of cops, as well as the rest of us. And those people who graduate high school, a lot of them, leave high school to go on and pursue careers that require them to swear an oath to uphold and defend something they've never freaking studied. Mm -hmm. So it's too late. I mean, for, in my little mind, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, it's basically too late. I mean, we can do what we can for the schools, and I do. I'm up there all the time. I've got my Obama's Enemy t-shirt on. I've got a drone umbrella t-shirt on. I've got all these things, and the kids ask me about this, mm -hmm. which is good. It's probably the only thing that they ever hear about the government, but the thing is, if we wait for these kids to get educated and us to change the school around, they're going to already have taken our guts. You know? it's, a, it's a race. We're in a sprint for the finish line. That's, that's, another, that's what the OP is. I don't know if you're familiar, uh, Aaron, you want to speak to that? Actually, we still haven't gotten finished with our introduction. Yeah, yeah I just realized. Uh, okay, so, okay, maybe I should finish doing that. Yeah, it just left off on Cindy. So. You're done? She started that whole little... Okay, okay. Sorry. We got off in the weeds, didn't we? Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, sorry. So, um, yeah, my name is Janice, and um, I need to learn about the Constitution because I, I realized that I didn't get an education about it. You know, I heard a bill is a bill uh, on, the, on the cartoon. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. about it. Yeah. You know, that was it. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's how it works. That's all I need to know School because only all these upstanding citizens get moved up into those positions because supposedly they were getting vetted by people that were already vetted. I mean, I just had all this confidence that everything was handled. So I just like, okay, they're handling it. And I just go about my little life, you know, and the more I learn about it, the, the more I see that um, we need to get a grip on our youth. And little did I know that I was going down the community organizing trail when I just want, I saw some drug dealers waiting for the kids at the bus stop. And I started organizing my community. And the city jumped on board, we got a quarter million dollar grant. Well, as soon as they saw me actually, you because I used a buzzword, and the buzzword was sustainable. You know, well, we can do this, we can be sustainable. That's a big word in the progressive liberal world. And um, once they heard that word, it was like, you know, all of a sudden they saw checkerboard squares. And they're like, oh yeah, she's one of us or whatever. So like they helped me secure this quarter million dollars. And, and then I started like doing things that were actually working in the neighborhood. And I had all these great plans about, you know, the kids and how we were going to, like, design things to guide and give our kids good direction. Oh, my God. They couldn't get rid of me fast enough, <laughs> you know, because all of a sudden they realized, wait a minute, you're taking away all our, our meal tickets here because we need high poverty. We need high drug addiction. We need high crime to get more money from the feds, you know. And I start recognizing this big, nasty web they weaved and uh, you know now I'm kind of like the lone ranger up there in the world <laughs> in the which world school? pardon me which school here? what school yeah what, which, which area pardon me where are you from what, what area Long Long Washington Long Long yeah Long so uh, yeah so I still believe you know that we need to 
get a hold of our, get a hold of the kids. I have a 20 year old son who got a football scholarship to a university, and he went there for about a year. And um, you know, he got too lonely for home. Thank God, because right about that time, 2011, 2012, I started finding out what these universities are really doing to these kids, to these people. And thank God he came home. You know, when he's home, he's getting a good country education. So, uh, I'm here to learn so I can try to teach. You know, really, I think. And, I, and I'm oh. in a career that I am dictated to by the RCWs and the WAC, which is the Washington Administrative Code, which is, tells you how to follow the laws that they have in those RCWs. So, I understand what you're saying. And, uh, okay, so as an example, since you're familiar with the WAC, are you familiar with the definitions section of the WAC? Oh, no, I only read what I have to. <laughs> the only what applies to me. I mean, you know, that, that's a hair, so, hair raising. <laughs> so the WAC, another really fundamental word is the word license. It's for wearing our lives, right? Probably, I probably have read that, but it's been a while. So the definition of license, what I've read in the WAC, isn't anywhere near what it is in Oregon. As an example of what I'm talking about, and we can call them up if you want to. But in Oregon, the definition of license, all by itself, is permission required by law to pursue any commercial activity, trade, occupation, or profession. Commercial is the only context that is applicable to the definition of a license in the law. Are you pursuing a commercial activity when you go to the store to get a gallon of milk in your car? Well, that's messed up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is are the Washington you, administration? Are, are you, this, this is the Oregon definition. Oh. Washington definition doesn't spell that out to you. Oh, it's... It's that's, another one of those differences. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. That's why I want to. I, I would prefer to use the Oregon stuff as at least a uh, a better illustration of what the nature, the essence of what it is these words mean. Yeah, it's um, it's the difference between Oregon being clear and the legislature overriding it versus the Washington way, which is muddying it up so you can't figure it out in the first place. In other words, what is the definition of is? <laughs> yeah. you know, we're talking license, what we're talking about. Are really licensing and permits, uh, they're really interesting because the, you know, well, if you go to Black's Law, I believe Black's Law says it's permission to do something that otherwise wouldn't be legal to do. Yeah. Um, and that's what a license is. Permission to do something that would be illegal. Mm -hmm. So, so Like a license to kill. Work. So you got, <laughs> how about this? Concealed handgun license. Yeah. Are you pursuing a commercial activity or are you exercising a right? A right that in both the state constitution and the federal constitution has absolutely no qualifications for. No, no, you can do it only if you're doing this. Only if you're doing that. Only at this certain time, this certain place. The constitution's the supreme laws of the land say nothing about that. It just says you have that right. So here's license. Mm -hmm. Coming, coming across to us through the law as being something that's for commercial purposes only, but we're, tell, we're told to go out and get concealed handgun licenses to put our, our own protection inside our belt or under our coat during the winter time because we have to wear a coat. It's cold. We gotta, we gotta put a coat on and you're not gonna strap a gun on the outside of your coat. Hey Ben, have you seen any case law in Oregon <laughs> where th there has been somebody challenging a concealed carry permit for the purpose of it being non-commercial, like it was a non-commercial act? I'm not aware of one. Okay. I don't know if there isn't, but I'm, I just, I'm not aware of one. Okay. So, um, huge example. The word license directly infringes your capacity to go to church. Because going to church embodies two First Amendment rights, freedom of association, freedom of religion. Two First Amendment rights at once is what church is. And so, if you have a church that you'd like to go to, but it's across town, how do you get to it? Travel. Using the normal modes of getting there that everybody else does, in your car. Well, the DMV says, well, you got to renew your licenses, and it just turns out that, man, you just don't have any money in your pocket. You, you're, 
you're unemployed, you've got barely enough money to put in your gas tank to go to church. But you can't afford to renew your license or your registration. So, oh, well, I guess we'll have to pull your permission slip. A permission slip that is commercial in nature. And they will, a, car, a cop will pull you over. You don't have that paperwork, which is completely administrative. You've done nothing wrong. You've not injured anybody. It is a precondition that you have to pay for in order to exercise two First Amendment rights simultaneously. And it's something that's in our lives every day. We embrace it. Just because. Actually, there's a third one as well, freedom of movement. Yeah. Wouldn't that apply to freedom of assembly that's as well? A, that's, that's so such a no-brainer that it wasn't that's even a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. What was that? Hmm? The freedom of assembly, that's the 501c3 corporation church thing. Okay, well, it, all right, well, it's, it's a multi-dimensional problem. Yeah. yeah. So, but, you know, these are the kind of things that once you start learning even little tidbits, like the meaning of, the legal meaning of person or license, wow, the whole world changes. Yeah. And you can't unknow that. Yeah. yeah. Um, You've taken the red pill. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> before, before we go on to the next person, this, this is something I heard on the radio just yesterday on NPR about school districts and how they grab money. Uh, I think this was in Texas, and they have a law that says that there's money available for a kindergarten, and a kindergarten equals a session of kindergarten, whether it's a full day or half day. So the, so the school districts in Texas figured they can get more money if they make kindergarten half day sessions and have two of them. Now they can get twice the money. Oh, but wow. when they did that, they couldn't find enough five-year-olds to put in kindergarten, so they started grabbing four-year-olds. And the parents of the four-year-olds would say, oh, my kid's going to kindergarten early. He must be really smart. But the whole thing was a money-grabbing deal. Wow. <laughs> Aaron? Yep. Hi, Aaron. Hi. Um, I'm just, I'm here to learn more about the Constitution. Uh, I served in the Navy. Uh, I'm definitely what you call a patriot. I carry, I don't care, but I carry open, I don't care. The uh, Constitution says I can. But after talking, after meeting with them one day and seeing about the word license and what it actually said, really got me curious to find out more about it. The way the Constitution. I mean, I see what's what's going on in the world today, and it's you know, and there's too many uh, sheeple in this world. There's too many stupid people. I mean, they're just living their lives yes. like, and they think that that's what the government's supposed to do is run their life. Stupid, yeah. stupid. Yes, is a, is a correct term, but in the, in the definition of ignorant, it's not because they've chosen to be. Yeah. Because. Our society has designed it's, it's designed to protect, you know. I mean, it's, it's, but how you I, mean, I think it's funny because aren't ignorant. I yeah. mean, they rose above it. But I mean, it's just you know, and I want the knowledge to tell people. Because like, there's been times all throughout the summer, you know, carry an open carry, pick up. Easy way to describe them is correct. Well, why are you carrying a gun? Because it's your Second Amendment right. Well, what's that? Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. How many people don't know? Like you said. I mean, don't know what. He, he came out there, Ben came out there both. That was the one question I had to answer more than any when I was standing in front of the courthouse getting signatures for the sheriff. Yeah. Which one's our Second Amendment? Yeah, what's the Second Amendment? Yeah, I get that all the time. What's the second one. <laughs> but I want to just know, you know, I want to learn it so that way I know what I'm telling you, right? I'm Angela, and I am a firm believer that knowledge is power. And I'm not the smartest cookie in the cookie jar. But I have this deep set of morals that in order to be a good, upstanding citizen, you better know what the truth is and not be lied to, like we've been lied to. And what power do you have if you don't even know what the truth is? Because there is a very, very strict truth. If something's red, it's red, no matter if, something, if somebody tells you it's green. It's still red. And truth is truth. And the thing with uh, people saying, well, I can do my own truth, regardless of how whacked it is, you know, it's still 
It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. The truth is still truth, period. It's not so, relative. Yeah. yeah, it's not relative. Mm -hmm. It's still truth. Truth is truth. So, but the only way to know the truth is to get the knowledge. So that's why I'm here, is because I need the knowledge. But I didn't get, so I went to Oregon schools myself. But the thing is, as a parent of two teenage boys, what does that say as a parent if I didn't teach my children the truth? And it started late. I'm just now learning myself. And my 16-year-old getting it. Both of my kids are kind of getting it. But my 16-year-old goes to public school, and his teacher said, write a paper about one of the amendments. Choose any one you want. And just tell me what you're going to write about so I can approve it. <laughs> and he said, my son went, I would like to write about the First Amendment and how we are losing that in our society. And the teacher says, you can't, you can't write a paper about that. And he said, just proved his point. And he said, and he said, you telling me I can't write the paper is taking away that amendment. And the teacher agreed and says, fine, you can write the paper. But that's the knowledge I want and the truth I want to give to my children so that they can stand up to their teacher, not like, you know, um, a disrespectful teenager, but someone who stands up for themselves. Stands up for themselves and the teachers can say something with the truth that the teacher can't even argue over. And so he got to write his paper about how our First Amendment is being taken away. <laughs> and then when Obama just said just the other day that he now has agreed the UN trumps any constitution we have in the United States. The oh, UN. No That's and I was like, dude, you have got to be kidding me. That's the problem this. with this world is our knowledge is so not there that we can have a president of the United States say the UN trumps our constitution and most people, left wing, sorry, you're left wing, I'm so out? sorry. Did he come out? I don't think. He did. Yep. And I, my mouth fell open. Oh yeah, you should have heard Lars. Oh boy. He, he's, he's been pushing for that for years. It was like last week. It was like last week he said that and I was like. Because he signed the UN treaty. Oh, he said the UN, the UN small arms treaty. So the, what? The and he says that the it. UN overpowers the Constitution of the United States. Care if he signed it or not? Congress already said no. Yeah. He yeah, he pushed right. it through, and he says, "I'm sorry, the UN trumps any Constitution we have." But he's the president doesn't. Idiot. A, a the president is the executive branch. They don't get to create the law. Yeah, I know. But the you that's the, unfortunately, that's the way this country is going with uh, the people that just sit back and okay. not. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know the you know the treaty power. That's a combined authority of the president and the senate. So they both have to be involved in the treaty making. Yeah. And as far as the standing of uh, where treaties land, as far as supreme law of the land goes, they are on exact equal footing as acts of Congress. They are side by side each other in hierarchy. So, but neither one of them supersede the Constitution itself. Because the power to create that treaty comes from the office of the President and the Senate, both of which were created by the Constitution itself. The power didn't exist without the Constitution, and a lesser power cannot overturn a superior power. So it's kind of a logic thing. But how many people will believe him just yeah, because the he says you got a president that's trying to, yeah. to, to get rid of the Constitution, uh -huh. and people are just sitting back thinking that, oh, well, he's the president, and that's what he's supposed to do. It's like, wait, no, he's not. It's not, you know. He's taking care of that. With that he, they have to first stupefy the people. Yeah. By the way. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're getting everybody to bow down. That I'll give you money. Here's their money. Here's your money. Here's your money. Just do what I say, and we'll keep paying. That, that um, treaty thing when it came to the Senate, only failed by four yeah, it, votes. It's just recently that it really failed because of, one, the first of all was the Colorado incident. With, every, with the senators getting voted out of there, that, that, through the Democrats, that caused the biggest ripple. 
the biggest wave. That was great. And it was good because every all states and all Democrats were watching Except and realized Washington. your uh, mayor's against illegal guns. He has lost 90% of his mayors. Everybody's backing out because they're Back. realizing this isn't what you said you were out to I'm do. Good. But then even one of his main ladies that there in New York told him, you need to just go quit on it. Stop doing this because you're not going to get anything. People are starting to wake up, but we're not waking up fast enough. While that UN vote that the Senate made only missed by a few votes, keep in mind that that was just a pre-vote. That wasn't an actual vote on the yeah. UN treaty. Yeah. All, they, all they did was vote it and said, we're not even going to discuss it. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what that vote was all about. Yeah. We're not even. But that, like I said, but, it, but you know. I didn't know that. So so therefore, more that one there would have been a closer vote because when when it comes down to it, most of them would rather have a chance to discuss it. Yeah. And I mean, it's just voted, like you know, I mean, they voted not to discuss it. You know, all your gun background checks and all that, they've pretty much gone by the wayside. They know they can't take the guns. They screwed up to begin with and got more people, more guns, more guns, more guns. Now they're going after the ammunition. Well, so they ain't got the ammo, your guns are worthless. So the treaty power is in Article 2, Section 2, Paragraph 2. It says, in Section 2, it starts with the President shall. And it says, down here on the back, on the treaty power, it says, he shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present, uh, present concur. So he has to have two-thirds of the support of the Senate in order to pull off a treaty. Yeah, yeah but that's that's only when the president is Even though it's only supposed to be basically just doing, to keep guns out of doing, terrorist hands, which is the biggest smoke screen. Right. It's, it's, it's and this multiple levels of world with a majority opposed to Senator Missouri. It's just a way of getting the UN to come over here and take our guns. Yeah. That was that was just a majority vote, I think, too, instead of a yeah. super majority. Yeah. Um, Bring in fifteen thousand Russians to protect. So we got like, we got over three hundred thousand on our land right Everyone now. Everyone know the difference okay. between a majority and super majority vote? Super majority is way better. Is that three fourths of the con yes. of the Congress and well, a majority requires fifty one percent, a super majority requires two thirds. Two thirds. Yeah. Got one more ago, Jim. Um, my search for the truth started in the fifth grade when we were learning about who discovered America, and I had read some books about the Greeks and the Africans and the Scandinavians, and so I said, I don't think it's Columbus. And the teacher said, Well, why don't you write a paper about it? Here's a spend. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was back in the in the good old days. <laughs> And I, I went to the library, wrote a report, gave it in front of the class, and she liked it, and I got extra credit. Final exam comes, and it says, fill in the blank, who discovered America? And I'm going, uh. <laughs> Teacher comes over and says, I know you did a good job on the book report, but for the purpose of this test, you have to put Columbus. That just told me that in the fifth grade, I can't trust everything that I learned. I went to junior high school, I was lucky, even though it was public school, had a teacher in the eighth grade who would rush through history class, save about 10 minutes and say, now here's the real story. And then that, that went on. Um, my personal line of, uh, of study has to do with uh, the economy, the IRS, the, the illegal fed, um, words like we were talking about that have different meanings and to the point where I, I've actually challenged a couple of county recorders about how they record uh, IRS notices a lien. It's all a fraud. 99% of people who have their property taken away, not, not me, but uh, um, have it done so illegally because there is no day in court, there's no court case, the docket number, decision, stamp, seal, whatever. And when I lived in Seattle, and I did for years, I was um, 
sort of a guest host on a cable TV show, which really got me going. Because every week I would study something and then present it on that show. Uh, I had sort of an Andy Rooney spot at the end, so I had 10 minutes or I read the news. And I started learning about all the fraud that goes on in government, um, as well as vaccines, fluoride, and, and just everything. The FDA being an advocate of the corporate farmers and not an advocate of the quality of food that you and I eat. Um, the word individual, which I was getting at in the, in the IRS code, they say a person is a corporation, individual, trust, or I can't remember the, the fourth thing. And so when you get your individual tax return, you look at those words and you say, well, I, I guess I must be an individual because the other things are not me. But the IRS never defines the word individual. So how does a person, I shouldn't even say person, <laughs> man or woman, get volunteer to get involved in the federal income tax is by signing the W-4 that's put under your nose and you volunteer yourself into the system to be taxed and then they take it out and at the end of the year you want the residuals back so you sign another form which gets you into um, adhesion contracts. Adhesion contract means it's a terms of a contract that are not stated on the contract and who would sign anything like that if you didn't know all the terms, but people do. So back in 2000, I decided I can't do this anymore. And since then, I go, you know, I work someplace and they put a W-4 under my nose and I say, I can't sign that, it says right there. I give up my Fifth Amendment right, right on this form, and I would be lying if I, if I signed that form. So those, those are the areas that I've been studying, um, some on driver's license, some on, um, you don't own your land because you don't have the land patent anymore. You don't own your car because when the car was manufactured and came to the dealership, they took the manufacturer's certificate of origin and gave it to the state. And so the state has the birth certificate for the car. And the state says, it's our car, so we want you to keep it clean, have insurance, have registration, and do all this stuff because it's our car. Uh, I haven't studied the Constitution directly, and um, since I moved down from Seattle, we had, a, we had a legal eagle group up there we met once or twice a week. And I haven't seen a, any equivalent group down here, so I'm interested in this. This is my first time here. I know Ben for, for a few years now. Yeah. Um, so just to see how the Constitution ties into all this stuff that I've been studying. And this is a... Uh this is the first meeting that we've had, so we've been, you know, we're going to keep doing this. And hopefully, you know, one of the main purposes for, for me for this was uh, to, again, a lot of everything I try to do is to inspire. So uh, I'm hoping that, you know, at, for example, like you're in Longview, maybe you could start one of these up in Longview and, and counter what we're doing here. You know, this is going to be a monthly thing. So, I mean, you could do, you know, the opposite of what we're doing here uh, time-wise, you know, and have one here and then have one up there or something. And carry that knowledge and spread it around and then maybe that'll spread around to other areas you know it's I'm I'm not you know uh, any big deal when it comes to like the network on Facebook or anything I'm just one guy who had an idea and you know Ben he, he's got knowledge and I just don't like to sit around and wait for other people to do things so so I started a, I started a group and did this thing but you guys can do the same thing and you know spread it around and you know uh, this is what we were talking about before is the education of it you know it sadly you know our, our schools are lacking on the topic but you know it, it's up to us to educate ourselves on the Constitution because it is um, not in the best interest of the government to educate us on how they're infringing our rights they're not going to do it they don't they don't have any interest it, it, it's actually goes directly against their interests to educate us so they're gonna do everything in their power to dumb us down to uh, uh, try to misinterpret things and spin us in different directions. Uh, but it's up to us to educate ourselves and our children. I would disagree that it's against, it, it's, in, it's not in their best interest to dumb us down because we are the government, or at least we are supposed, supposed to be. Supposed to be. Yeah. 
So, but the thing is, is human history and the reality side of things. Human reality, history. reality. Yes, I agree. Yes, where he's going. Where he's going. The way our government is supposed yeah. to be designed, or it's supposed to be yeah. created, yeah. it's not. Government will always be used or sought to be used by people who have less than honorable intentions as a tool to achieve mm -hmm. those less than honorable intentions. And human history has every step of the way confirmed that. Mm -hmm. And we are still human beings at this end of the history spectrum. And we're no different, you know, DNA-wise from the people back in the day. So we are infected with the same faults as human beings. You know, the human vulnerabilities, greed, avarice, blah, blah, blah. And power corrupts. Power corrupts and, you know, all the rest of it. So that the fact is, is that based on the history of human nature, it is a complete conflict of interest to place education of the Constitution into the hands of the very thing that historically wants to abuse power. And if knowledge is power, it's in its direct non-interest to give that power to us or let us keep it through knowledge. And that Constitution is the fountain from which this particular version of government came from. And so since the nature of that government is to be confined by the Constitution, well, if they want to escape that confinement, it comes down to making sure we don't know how to keep them confined by actually knowing the Constitution. Uh, if I look back through history, the Industrial Revolution was an important period because before then, they say 90% of people either lived on a farm or were related to somebody on a farm. And then in the 1920s, I guess, uh, the Industrial Revolution in this country made people employees and we lost our self-sufficiency. And today only about 5% of people live on a farm or have some connection to somebody who lives on a farm. So now that we're dependent, and our focus is away from self-sufficiency, we've lost um, our, Autonomy. Our, our, our need to study law, to study farming, to study all those things which kept the, kept the self-sufficiency. Now we, we're dependent on employers and we just focus on that and focus on the income coming from that and that's where, the, that's where they, I see them wanting us to be. Uh, just making a paycheck and so we lost the self-sufficiency and we lost that knowledge that we should be studying. Um, yeah, we have an Affordable Care Act too, right? It's not affordable, <laughs> and they don't care. And, uh, you know, I'd like to piggyback off uh, something that Ben was saying as far as uh, like human uh, imperfections within the government. Um, this is a book I've been reading, uh, The Liberty Amendments by Mark Levin. Um, it's, uh, I've, I'm on the second reading through this book. Uh, it's got a bunch of scribbles through the margins. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the topics I'd like to bring up here, uh, and then actually, if, uh, if Ben, you'd be interested in uh, describing uh, like your involvement and uh, some of the background of the Sovereign Project uh, to, to them. I, I don't know. I, only, I, I have not been to any of their functions. I know okay. of them. I've visited their website. I've gone to uh, a court event that they were at, but I haven't been directly involved in what they've done. Uh, it, uh, th this this is uh, this is the Liberty Amendment. Oh, the, the Sovereign Project. Uh, it, we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I, I want to read this real fast here. We're talking uh, about constitutional right? Uh, it, well, th this this right here is not specific to, to, to anything other than the human frailties that we were just talking about before. Uh, the uh, the Supreme Court uh, have have actually endorsed slavery through uh, Dred versus Scott or Dred Scott versus Sanford. Uh, they've uh, affirmed segregation through Plessy versus Ferguson, and uh, they've upheld the internment of uh, Americans in Korematsu versus the United States. That's when, uh, in World War II, we interned Japanese Americans. 
And this is what, I, what he was talking about as far as um, how e our government is susceptible to the same human frailties as us all. They're all flesh and blood, and they're all capable of, of making huge sins. Go ahead, Ben, I'm sorry. Um, this is a really dark part of the history of what we need to get at the bottom of if we're going to understand the true nature of things so we can fix it for real. And unfortunately, um, our country started off at a point where European types were kind of in this evolutionary transition as far as uh, higher thinking. And the people from the north, for the most part, opposed slavery. The people in the south didn't. They demanded slavery. And constitutionally, just so you know, the Constitution is a contract. It is a legally binding contract. Terms, conditions, and signatures, parties involved. The only parties that were involved in the making of that contract were people who were legally recognized as state citizens. It is the legal identity, the lawful identity as a state citizen that qualifies you for the full bloom protections of the Constitution. And they call it great compromise. And the South refused to ratify, to be a part of the Constitution unless slavery stayed intact. And so it was put into the deal. And the only compromise on that compromise is that the North said, hey, you know what? We really need you guys right now. We need to get this thing done so we can get on the road, get this thing working, get some water under the bridge, but we'll let that ride for now. But in the meantime, we are going to limit you. We, we want the condition. We want you to meet the condition of limiting that little compromise to the fact that you guys will no longer be able to import slaves. Beginning in the year 1808. 1808 was the ending of the constitutional authority to import slaves. But the slaves that were there were constitutionally uh, authorized. Part of history. And, but it is, it's a reality. And so what Dred Scott uh, versus, Sanford. versus Sanford was talking about was that quite literally slaves were not allowed to be cognized in the law as citizens. They were not only not citizens, they were incapable of becoming citizens. Mm -hmm. And the decision of that case was that anything short of an amendment to the Constitution itself would fail to fix that problem. And so, the Civil War came along, and the Civil War amendments at the end of the Civil War came along to fix that. Thirteenth Amendment abolished slavery. Fourteenth Amendment created citizenship for the former slaves. Fifteenth Amendment elected, gave them suffrage. Yeah. We're waiting for the coffee to grind, folks. So. Every one of the amendments from the 13th Amendment on that deals with rights of people, and it's almost always, uh, well it is always voting rights, suffrage. Every single one of them has this at the end of it. Congress, every one of these amendments deals with voting rights. Every one of them says this or something very similar to it. Congress shall have power to enforce this article, meaning amendment, by appropriate legislation. These amendments that bestowed suffrage on women, on people who are 18 years old, on blacks, all of those amendments, those lofty things called amendments, utterly depend on Congress passing a law when they want to, because it says they have the power to do it. It doesn't say Congress shall do it. It says Congress shall have power to, <laughs> not Congress shall. And the thing is, is when you're dealing with a right that hinges on whether or not Congress passes a law to make it so, what kind of a right is that? Yeah. Do you think the original Bill of Rights has that kind of protection to it? No. It's automatic. Right? Uh, sure, thanks. So, 
This is another one of those red pill situations. Hmm. <laughs> I, um, Got your name. You, you, you're talking about the, the Washington State Constitution, and something just popped up in my head. We had the 1879, 1878 that was replaced by 1889, and I need to go back and look at it. Did the original one say Constitution for the state of Washington replaced by the Constitution of the state of Washington? I would have to pull it up. I've got it on the, uh, okay. the Washington. Because that, that would be important, saying that we the people wrote, wrote this constitution for you, replaced by one, it's them telling us what to do. If it's not up there, if I haven't put it up there on that group yet, I need to put it up there. If I have any overpasses one, I know for sure. Uh, I'll make sure it's put it there. <laughs> so, there a line here? What? Yes, there is. It's just been dormant for a while, so the screen looks like that. Uh -huh. So, uh, as far as... Uh, so, just to answer your question, you, you, you referred to Dred Scott versus Sanford, mm -hmm. and, and it was kind of, sounds like it was referred to by Mr. Levin as being one of those human frailty things. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that that particular reference was authorized by a constitutional contract. It wasn't. Yeah, it was not only a human yeah. frailty thing, because it was. That's a human frailty part of the Constitution. But in this case, it was locked in under law by the Constitution. Yeah, and, and I understand. That. I, my, my point is that even our lawmakers and, and just the government in and of itself, even in the creation of this country, they're all susceptible to politics, you know, and human frailties. So it's just something to keep in mind, you know, as, as far as our conversation that we were talking about originally. So. Uh, as far as like uh, wrapping this up, I, I, I know uh, there's something going on with, uh, uh, I think his name Bill Darby or something like that with the Sovereign Project. I was curious if you could kind of, if you knew anything about it or if you could wrap it up and, and talk about that and then we'll, we'll all. So I believe uh, there is going to, Dave Darby is kind Dave of the, the lead figure for a project called the Sovereign Project. Uh, they live here in Clark County. And their main issues that they're tackling are property rights and the right to travel. And they are in a trial sequence right now. They're in the courts. Um, and they've got a lot of information that I'm still pretty new to. I can't really speak to it myself, but they've got a lot of that information plugged in onto their website to learn from, especially uh, the, uh, the, the main uh, thrust of what how they're doing what they're doing is that they are recapturing through, through lawful process, they are recapturing their original status as sovereign state citizens. Because uh, through however many different ways this is taking place, the reading that I've done tells me that we've lost ourselves. We have lost our lawful status as state citizens. And if we are not state citizens, we are not beneficiaries of the Constitution. And literally, explicitly, Congress, as an example, Washington, D.C., is a piece of land that is the seat of the federal government. The Constitution allowed, authorized the creation of that piece of land for the purpose of giving Washington, D.C., and the people who do our, government, our federal government work, created that piece of land for them so they would be completely autonomous in that landscape. They can defend themselves without any permission from anyone. That piece of land is completely distinct and unique in this country. It is a federal city. There's nothing state about it. As a result, the people who call Washington, D.C. home, they are not state citizens. They are federal citizens. And there's a line at the bottom of their their license plates that says taxation without representation. That was one of the battle cries of the Revolutionary War. Taxation, no taxation without representation. In Washington, D.C., there is taxation without representation. <laughs> and it's a constitutional result because their legal identity is as a federal person, a federal citizen. And because they are a federal citizen, they are not a state citizen. 
you have to be a state citizen to be qualified under the Constitution to vote. Therefore, D.C. citizens have nobody representing them in Congress. Their lives are governed by the state citizens who occupy Congress at any given time. And Congress rules their world. Their rights, their rights are provided and provided to them and managed by Congress. Constitution. Don't know. But same thing goes for people who live in the territories. That's under Article 4, Section 3, I believe. People who live in the territories are, again, not state citizens. They are territorial citizens. Congress literally creates their courts from an Article 1 power, a, a congressional legislative power, creates the courts for those places. They decide what the courts look like and how they work. They decide everything about the government of those territories. And the people who live there just got to take it as it comes. It's one of the... The, the Heller decision, because it was within that city, uh, it becomes actually quite unique because of it. Um, because it didn't fall under any state, it falls under purely federal citizenship. And then went to Sco uh, Supreme Court, the Supreme Court decision is based on purely federal law. And and when I was talking before about the IRS forms, part of that adhesion contract, when you sign it and the terms are not there, is that you're a federal citizen. Because state citizen, if you're really a state citizen, it wouldn't apply to you. So now you know how important it is to be very protective, jealously protective of your legal status because there are literally no less than four different kinds of citizen under the Constitution. One's a state citizen, and the other three are all federal citizens. D.C. citizen, territorial citizen, and the 14th Amendment citizen. The 14th Amendment may have had its place, its role to play at the end of the Civil War, but I will put it out there. I will propose that that thing needs to be dump in the can and the South get on board with actually bestowing state citizenship on everybody that lives in their, in their lands. Because it was because the Southern states were understood to not be willing to give state citizenship to the former slaves. That's the reason why they fought the war. They weren't, they weren't about it. The, the feds who fought the war and defeated the South knew that the states were not, the southern states were not going to give citizenship, state level citizenship to these former slaves. The only option they had was to create it themselves. And the authority that created it was a federal authority through the 14th Amendment. And that's why it says at the bottom of that amendment and every other amendment after the Civil War, Congress shall have power to enforce this through a law. And as an example of what that means, 1868 was when the federal, the 14th Amendment was ratified. ratified. It took 100 years for the 1950s and 1960s Civil Rights Acts to be passed to stop the Jim Crow laws down south. 100 years for the 14th Amendment to have teeth. Because it's up to Congress. Mm -hmm. yeah. They have the power to. They don't have to do it. They just have the power to do it. So it required enough political pressure to be brought into their arena before they finally did something about Jim Crow down south. That's what a federal citizen is. That's the nature of the protection that you have as a federal citizen. Good times. Okay, and there's a number of ways that, that besides IRS, that we volunteer ourselves to be federal citizens. One is filling out a voter registration form. On it, it says, are you a US citizen? And people will check yes to get their voter card. Well, I went, when I realized that, I rescinded it and I didn't vote for years. And this summer, I went down in person <laughs> to fill out the uh, form and where it said, are you a US citizen? I crossed it out and I said, Washington State, with the capital C. And handed it back to them because what it is, it's a contract between you and who else. So 
I can change the terms of the contract. If you don't agree with it, then you don't have to sign the other end. So I handed it to the woman and she looked at it and said, oh, okay, and I got my card. It's kind of funny how the very ignorance that they've infected everybody with allowed him to get away with what he wanted to do, and that was to secure his real estate citizenship. You know, uh, one last topic, if we could cover this, and then, then we'll all take off. Uh, can you mention, I, you told me the first day that we met, you, you were talking about your driver's license uh, story. Uh, you want to talk about that, and then we'll just wrap it up? Just as, as, far, as far as your signature block, as far as, far as the, the, the signature block, as far as how, how you signed it. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. The nutshell of it is based on many things. Many things that if I were to go through them would give us probably an hour at least worth of talking. Uh, suffice to say, in lieu of that conversation, uh, the motor vehicle laws do not apply to the public. They, the public is not subject to the laws for registration, licensing. Insurance, if you want to go there. And, and that too. Okay. So, um, how about parking and uh, fuel tax? If you're not subject to, or you're just not subject to it. Well, no, they're not. Motor vehicle laws. Parking is usually city and fuel tax is not. And I'll let you have the floor if you want to have an hour. <laughs> yeah. This gentleman back here, Mr. Richard Koenig, is largely responsible for what I know and how well I know. Uh, he has permission from the Oregon State uh, Legislature. Well, they're, they're, le they're legal counselors. They're legal attorneys. The legislators themselves have attorneys who work for them. And those attorneys help in the creation of the laws. And for people who are down there doing lobbying work, they some, some of those folks draft law bills. And they have to submit them to the legislative council people for approval, supervision, editing, that sort of thing. Well, he got so good at what he was doing down there that they basically rubber stamped him and said, you have permission to just draft bills at your leisure. You know what you're doing. We, you don't need our supervision. Anymore. So he can draft bills without supervision down the road. And what's that? It was called political leverage. But that's the gentleman back there uh, who is largely responsible for why I'm sitting here right now, standing here, I'm talking. I'm talking. Driver's license signature. Oh. Uh, I was told by a judge that if I didn't do this, I would be held criminally liable. And I got pulled over up north battle, in Battleground by a cop who was in training. She had a supervisor with her. She came up to me. She pulled me over because the one of the bulbs around my license plate, nope, one of the bulbs around the registration plate that was not mine, that was nonetheless on my vehicle, that bulb was out. And she pulled me over because of that one bulb being out. I hadn't injured anybody, I wasn't doing anything unsafe. That was why I pulled me over and she came up, she goes, let me see your paperwork. I said, well, I don't have paperwork because I'm a member of the public and I don't have to have paperwork to exercise my right to travel on the highway. She said, really? Huh, stay right here, sir. So she disappeared for a couple minutes and comes back after having consulted her supervisor in the car, and she says, get out of your car, sir. So she arrested me, put me in the back of the car, and the supervisor went through the computer showing her how to ring up somebody like me, and they generated a ticket on their printer, and, and they got out of their car, and just as a little side note, when they got out of their car, most cars have a little doorbell tone that rings when the door gets opened up. And this car had one too, and when they opened their doors, it was the sound of a cash register drawer going cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. That's a recording of a cash register drawer. That doesn't come off the factory line. The door tone of the factory vehicle had to be 
taken out and replaced with that recording by willfulness. And the message that it was telling me was that we're revenue agents. That's what we do. We're not about peace and safety and all that sort of thing. Anyway, that's the side note I'm done with. Um, they handed me a, a citation, a criminal citation, a misdemeanor for not having paperwork. It's a crime to not have paperwork. Papers, please. And so at that point, I didn't have the resources to slog through the trenches in the courts anymore. And I decided, hey, got to do what I got to do. I got to start making a living. Got to start surviving. Stop being a burden to the people around me who are supporting me because I can't make money. So I went and got one of these things because the judge says, if you get one of these things, then we'll knock it down from a crime to a mere violation. You can pay that off whenever you want to. How, how, you know, when you want to. But when I signed this, I made sure they knew that I was not consenting. Above my signature, it says, without prejudice, under extreme threat, duress, and coercion. So it is a public record that I am under an extreme threat, duress, and coercion in my choice. You know? in my act of acquiring this piece of documentation. That's what you wanted to do. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell us how unusual that is. Um, well, I, I've written something similar. Okay, so for people who have been studying this kind of stuff, they do little things like that. And, but it's not very common, as you might imagine, because most of us are, again, public school graduates. I, I did that in Seattle I don't know, eight years ago, and the woman behind the counter followed me outside and asked me why I wrote that. <laughs> of course I'll tell you. <laughs>